Radio 4. And now at half past nine, Kaleidoscope, which comes this evening from the Cathedral Church of Christ and Blessed Mary the Virgin in Durham. It's presented by Alec Clifton Taylor. This reverend aged abbey is girded almost round with the renowned river of Weir, in which, as in a glass of crystal, she might once have beheld the beauty, but now only the ruin of her walls. To this sumptuous church came the last and great translation of St. Cuthbert. This great building straddles a lofty sandstone bluff around which the river Weir, in a wooded gorge, describes an elongated horseshoe and, a factor which could never for a moment be forgotten, the neck of this peninsula faces towards Scotland. In Dr. Johnson, it evoked sensations, as he put it, of rocky solidity and indeterminate duration. And in many of us, it must surely do the same. Although he had died over 300 years before, the founding of the cathedral at Durham in 995 was closely linked with St. Cuthbert, for centuries the most venerated English saint. St. Cuthbert himself was a very remarkable man, and from the very beginning, Cuthbert seemed to have made an impression on his contemporaries. Rosemary Kremp from the Department of Archaeology of the University of Durham. Unlike some more cloistered monks, he seems very early on to have established himself as a figure in the whole of the Northumbrian hill country around because he walked into places, as Bede said, where other people wouldn't normally go, wild places in the hills where wild people lived. And so he has a sort of almost Wesleyan streak in the way that he went up into the dales and the hills and took Christianity. He always lived very austerely. He has many stories told that impressed his contemporaries, the ones we all know of him standing up to his waist in the sea and praying in the night. And then in the morning, how the monk who spied on him saw him come out of the water and the sea otters come to dry his feet with their fur. He was somebody who Bede describes as a rather appealing character, very much attuned to the natural world in which he lived. And do you remember that bit where he says that in the night when he couldn't sleep, this is Bede telling the story in his life of St Cuthbert, that he would get up and walk round the island of Lindisfarne looking at the things on the island. And so it's perhaps not unreasonable today that we call eider ducks, you know, Cuthbert's ducks, and uh, the little fossils that one finds on Holy Island, St Cuthbert's beads. He always seems to have had this prophetic gift and it is recorded in Bede, and so contemporaneously, that he said that he would rather leave the island and have his body taken away from the island than that wicked or schismatic people, as it was then put, should occupy it. And this was what the monks remembered when there were the Viking invasions in the mid ninth century, in the 870s. And so they made this extraordinary decision to take his body, which had been found 11 years after he had been buried to be incorrupt. You remember that he died in 687 and then was lifted up again in 698 and put into a wooden coffin, which you can now see in the cathedral. Very remarkable relic it is. And they decided to take that and some of their other treasures, the head of St Oswald, um, bones of some other saints, books and a cross, and move. But his body went with them, really like a talisman, really as though he was still alive, still leading them. 
and all through the journey his wishes and where he wanted to be were the overriding factor. In 995 when they were returning from the south the body according to legend or tradition remained immovable and St Cuthbert designated his own place of residence for the future at Durham. <laughs> The present cathedral was begun in 1093 and was substantially complete and wholly vaulted within 40 years, which was really remarkably quick considering the scale of the undertaking. Since this was also a great Benedictine abbey, extensive monastic buildings were also required, and these buildings, adapted to other uses, have survived better here than in any other English cathedral except perhaps Chester. the monk's refectory, which is now part of the library. Close by is the great kitchen, a fascinating building, erected in the latter part of the 14th century to the design of the master mason, John Lewin. This is octagonal and designed like a great stone tent with six huge fireplaces and a most ingenious vault of intersecting ribs rising to what was once no doubt a central louver, such as still survives at Glastonbury. Still the dean's kitchen until 1940, this building now houses the muniments. And marvellous to relate, the building accounts for the first 18 months recorded on both sides of a 16-foot roll of thin sheepskin parchment survive. Martin Snape, the cathedral archivist. It's the earliest fabric account that we have for any building in connection with the cathedral. And the kitchen took eight years to build, from 1366 to 1374, the only surviving account of expenditure on the wages of the masons and workmen is this one, which covers the period from Martinmas, that's the 11th of November, 1366, for 18 months. And week by week, the names of the masons who worked on the building are given, and the amounts which they received, so that, for instance, in the week that I'm looking at now, John of Ripon received 18 pence, old pence, of course, whereas in the very next week he received two shillings and sixpence, so that the first week must have been a short one. The number of masons involved ranged from 15 to 20, and four times a year we are given the name of the master mason, John Lewin, who is quite a well-known medieval architect, who would be not only clerk of works, as it were, as we would understand it today, but also the architect responsible for the design. He received 66 shillings and eightpence per quarter and at Christmas an allowance to buy himself a fur-lined robe. The whole cathedral is built of a local buff-coloured sandstone from the coal measures. For the monastic buildings, they used a quarry still there, just down by the river. It was called the Sacrist's Quarry. For the cathedral itself, three nearby quarries supplied all the original stone. Keepier, a mile and a half down the weir, and Baxter Wood and Littleburn, a mile or two to the west of the city. All these three were long ago worked out, but happily there's another, Dunn House, near Barnet Castle which yields very similar stone, and this quarry, which is still active, supplies all that's needed now at Durham and has plenty in reserve. The roofing materials are also a great pleasure here. Bluish-grey Westmoreland slates. Every one, of course, hand-shaped and beautifully graded from the largest at the base to the smallest at the ridge. Those west towers once carried lead-covered wooden spars, I don't at all regret the disappearance of them. You see the arcading, uh, which covers the whole of the upper surface? Nicely varied in treatment, isn't it? Four different sizes of arches and arcades. Some round, some pointed, some blind, some pierced. 
how about the central tower? As a design, it isn't quite so successful because the top stage, which ought to be the tallest, is short. It looks, in fact, like an afterthought, which is exactly what it was. Just below the upper windows, you can see battlements, which were obviously designed to crown the tower, the tower designed in 1465. But it was then realized, quite rightly, that this tower ought to rise higher in relation to the other two. How odd, though, that those battlements weren't removed and used again at the top. It's this tower which houses the peal of eight bells. The bell major is Malcolm Johnson. The bells of Durham are like the majority of rings of bells in other cathedrals, in that they are hung for the English style of bell ringing, which requires the bell to be swung through a full circle. When our bells are left during the week between services and after practice, they're left with their mouth downwards. However, when we start to ring them for practice or for service, we have to ring them to a point where they the opposite way up with their mouths upwards. And then when we come to ring them in full peel, that is all together, we ring them from that mouth upwards position around in a full circle. And because they go around in a full circle, we get the full-throated sound of the bell coming out. Each of the sequences of the bells is called a change, and the simplest one is rounds, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight from the lightest bell, which is called the treble, round to the heaviest bell, which is called the tenor. Another change, another order of the bells, could be two, one, four, three, six, five, eight, seven. And in order to do that in the tower, in order to just simply change from rounds to that two, one, four, three, six, five, eight, seven, the bells have got to be controlled by the ringers. The two has got to ring slightly earlier, and the one has got to pause in order to allow the two to go in front. Now, this is where the skill comes in. And additionally, as the bells don't sound immediately as the bell ringer pulls the bell, a certain amount of anticipation has got to be involved as well. Methods are composed of lots of rows of changes. When we come to eight bells, we have over 40,000 changes to choose from. I'm standing at the moment on the lovely large velvet lawn of Paris Green. All the Durham lawns are quite exquisitely manicured. I am looking along the whole length of the cathedral from the north. Just behind me is the castle, with its stone keep perched aloft on a conical mound of earth. It's a large agglomeration of many different dates, but begun very soon after the conquest. This is now part of the university, but it was for centuries the official residence of the Prince Bishops, many of whom embellished it. It was also an arsenal, a storehouse for large supplies of both food and of armour, and strongly fortified. There weren't many powerful landowning families in the far north, but there were a few, such as the Nevilles of Raby. In the city of Durham itself, though, the top man was unquestionably the bishop. The bishops of Durham were accorded the courtesy title of prince. And if you look at the coat of arms of the Sea of Durham, you'll find that the mitre resting on top of the shield preserves to this day a peer's coronet round the base. In the Middle Ages, they could muster troops and commandeer ships. They could levy taxes to defray the cost of this. They could mint their own money, appoint judges, administer mines and forests, distribute land. In fact, within the Palatinate, as it was called, their rule was absolute. They became very rich, and some of them wielded really tremendous authority. 
of Bishop Beck, for instance, whose episcopate nearly coincided with the reign of one of the strongest of all our kings, Edward I, his steward wrote, there are two kings in England, the Lord King of England wearing a crown in the sign of his regality, and the Lord Bishop of Durham wearing a mitre in place of a crown in sign of his regality in the Diocese of Durham. He was, like all the Prince Bishops, the Commander-in-Chief of the Palatinate forces, and in 1296 he rode into battle against the Scots under John Balliol with the King's forces, clad in a purple cloak with armour inlaid with gold. We go into the building by the north door. Oh, but where's the knocker? My favourite knocker in the world. The famous bronze sanctuary knocker used for centuries here by fugitives and justice, with the wild face, the alert pricked up ears, and the flame-like hair. Ah, oh, I see it's gone to London for restoration. The door looks eerily bereft without it, I must say. In my young days, I used to keep a diary. And the other day, I found the entry about my first visit to Durham. After describing how thrilled I was by the views of the exterior, I went in. I had expected it to be fine, I wrote, but it's so magnificent that I simply gasped for joy. I don't want to be accused of making any exaggerated claims, so let me just say, quite simply, that the Cathedral of Durham is the supreme masterpiece of Romanesque architecture in any country. In England, we generally use the term Norman to describe the buildings of the later 11th and most of the 12th centuries, but the generic word is Romanesque, applicable to a style of architecture characterized by round arches, massive walls and piers, and small windows, which flourished all over the western half of Europe for something like 300 years. The piers are 27 feet high and not much less in circumference, which means that there's far more masonry than there should be to support a not particularly wide nor lofty vault. In beauty of proportion, in fact, most of the Gothic cathedrals far surpass Durham. Yet, paradoxically, it is more than anything else on the size of the piers, alternately composite and circular, that the almost overwhelming grandeur of this interior depends. The circular piers have boldly incised patterns. The chevron, the DARPA, the spiral and the vertical flute a splendid enrichment. Nor should it ever be forgotten that Durham was a pioneer building structurally, very much in advance of its time. Move eastwards to the Neville screen designed almost certainly by Henry Yeverley, one of the greatest architects of the Gothic age. And you're looking at the finest reredos to be seen in any of the English cathedrals. The material, surprisingly perhaps, is car stone. It was carved in Normandy, shipped in battles to Newcastle, and brought overland from there. It's a design composed almost entirely of two elements only. Vertical lines, and canopies, some crowned by spires. But there's nothing simple about it. It's a work of the utmost subtlety, and despite its size, of exquisite delicacy too. When it was finished, this screen, which stretches right across the sanctuary, harbored no fewer than 107 figures in alabaster. These have all disappeared, and thank goodness even the Victorians never replaced them, although I believe at least one dean wanted to. For in my view, this screen is actually better without the figures. The hollow spaces under the canopies and the glimpses through to the chapel of the nine altars beyond lighten it and actually add to its beauty. The whole screen was presented and paid for by one man, John Lord Neville of Raby Castle. It was immediately behind the screen that stood the ferretry with the shrine of St. Cuthbert. This was removed by Henry VIII. Apart from the actual coffin and a few very precious pieces associated with the saint himself, 
his pectoral cross, and his stole, maniple, and girdle, masterpieces of Anglo-Saxon needlework. These are now displayed in the new treasury. What survives here now is just a simple slab inscribed Cuthbertus. Here at the West End is the Gallery Chapel. In England, this term is usually, as of Ely and Lincoln, applied to a large porch formerly on the route of the Sunday procession. The symbolical reference was to Christ going before his disciples into Galilee after the resurrection. But here at Durham, the Galilee exceptionally was a needy chapel, situated at the west end of the building because when they started building at the east end, the usual place, the foundations collapsed. Complete by 1175, it was the achievement of one of the grandest of Durham's bishops, Hugh du Puise. Grandest and most worldly. When he was appointed to the see, he already had three illegitimate children by three different ladies. The Archbishop of York strongly objected, but not so the Pope, nor, of course, King Stephen, who was his uncle. Du Puise was a great feudal lord who built lavishly all over the diocese, from Darlington to Norham. The gallery was intended for the use of women. It's quite unlike the rest of the cathedral, wide and low, and within a little forest of slenderly supported arches. This chapel recalls in its proportions some of the early mosques. Here lie the bones of another of County Durham's famous historical characters the learned and venerable Bede, who has been called the father of English history. He was 40 years younger than Cuthbert and died in 735 in the monastery at Jarrow, where most of his life had been spent. But in the 11th century, a monk from Durham managed to appropriate his bones, a coveted relic, and to bring them here. And here, or so it's said, they still are. I must confess that visually I am no lover of cathedral organs, which can be eyesores and even when well designed are often a visual obstruction. Today I am glad to observe that the organ here, divided to left and right above these choir stalls, is decently unobtrusive. But of course musically an organ in a cathedral is of great importance, and music has always held rather a special place in the services here. This comes out rather delightfully in the epitaph of John Brimley, who was master of the choristers here in the time of the first Queen Elizabeth. John Brimley's body here doth lie, who praised God with hand and voice. By music's heavenly harmony, dull minds he made in God rejoice. His soul into the heavens is lift to praise him still that gave the gift. Now, in the time of the second Queen Elizabeth, the master of the choristers and organist is Richard Lloyd. In monastic times, we do know that mass was sung daily by the master of the song school called Mr. John Brimley with certain deacons and choristers, uh, the said Mr. John Brimley playing upon a pair of fair organs. It's likely that Brimley was the last cantor of the monastery and certainly he was the first organist of the cathedral. The sound of the organ in the cathedral in 1634 is rather pleasantly described by some soldiers, officers, who did a journey surveying 26 counties and including their impressions of the music. And they said of Durham, away then, we were called to prayers where we were wrapped with the sweet sound and richness of a fair organ which cost one thousand pounds. He also mentioned the orderly, devout and melodious harmony of the choristers. acoustic in the cathedral I think is perfect for singing. It is resonant but not over resonant so as to confuse everything. The choir doesn't have to sing 
all that loud for the sound to carry down the building. You know, I would say to the boys or, or the men, you know, let the building work for you. Durham is no longer a bulwark against the Scots, for that has long been unnecessary. But here still is the great cathedral of the North, and one of the four finest in England. It's fitting that the last words should come from the Dean. I'm pretty certain that the deeds and chapters of our great medieval cathedrals are primarily, although modern opinion makes them very reluctant to admit it, the custodians, the caretakers of buildings noble, powerful, evocative buildings. Now, what they do with them is, of course, very important, but it is the building which largely determines what ought to be done. For example, Durham has its own distinctively massive style, its own distinctively magnificent scale. And so any form of worship in it which attempted to be cosy or conversational would be totally out of place, at odds with its architectural context. And in cathedral worship, preeminently, the architectural context should always be regarded as, like the music, a vital ingredient and not simply as a bit of decoration. My own experience here at Durham suggests that it is as buildings that our ancient cathedrals exercise their major spiritual influence. It is their very stones which speak, speak to the local community and to the wider public, much more clearly perhaps than their preachers. In County Durham, the local people certainly feel that the cathedral is theirs, and this proud sense of possession has very little to do with formal membership of the church. You see it most dramatically of all on the afternoon of the Miners' Gala each year when the cathedral is crammed to capacity for what you could call the Harvest Festival of the local community. It's then that the colliery bands with their banners process up the nave as they play those great nostalgic hymns of the last century. And I find few things more moving. Brass bands in this part of the world still arouse a quasi-religious devotion, and the cathedral, I'm glad to say, is still acknowledged as the most appropriate place in which to express it. of Durham Cathedral and this evening's edition of Kaleidoscope, which was introduced by Alec Clifton Taylor from the Cathedral Church of Christ and Blessed Mary the Virgin. The producer was John Powell.